Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video, we are going to analyze an interesting poem by Nilim Kumar titled, I shall go back in the new year. Let's know about the poet. Mr. Nilim Kumar is a physician. He lives in Guwahati. He has written 17 collection of poems, three novels, and a collection of essays. His works are translated to French, Bangla, Nepali, and many regional languages of India. He has participated in many literary festivals of national and international repute. His poems are included in the anthology of Signatures, 100 Indian Poets, edited by K. Sachidanandan. Everybody would like to start New Year with a lot of resolutions, promises, new plans, new life. But the poem begins with something which seems to be a pessimistic thought. The poet wants to go back in time this year. Everyone would like to begin New Year with a lot of New Year. Everyone wants to start the New Year with a lot of resolutions, promises, new plans, new life. But the poem begins with something which seems to be a pessimistic thought. The poet wants to go back in time this New Year. People always look forward. But here the poet seems to look back. He says that everybody thinks about marching towards what seems to be the better future, but he wishes to go backwards this new year. He takes up many resolutions for the upcoming new year. Now the poet starts making some resolutions for the upcoming year. He says that every year people think of buying a new vehicle, but at this time he says that he would sell his two cars and he would buy a new bicycle. Now the poet has started making some new resolutions for the upcoming year. He says that every year people think of buying a new vehicle, but this time he says that he would sell his two cars and buy a bicycle. Commenting on the resolutions for the upcoming year, the poet says that many people think of building a new house, some of them think of buying a flat. On the other hand, the poet wants to become somewhat primitive and he would like to demolish the walls of his compound and he would like to build a bamboo fence so that the fresh air may pass through the bamboo mesh to his home just like the way it used to be in the past. The poet emphasizes that everybody wants to move on with the future but he says that he thinks of going back that new year. He says that everybody would like to buy a lot of things or an Android mobile handset at least. But he says that he would just repair the broken screen of his old handset, which he purchased for just rupees 800. He says that he would not get his eyes tested, but would buy a Chinese reading glass at a price of 150 rupees from the streets of Fancy Bazaar. Making a humorous comment, he says that he would rush backwards from civilization this time. That shows that he has a desire to change himself into a more primitive or less civilized person. In the process of making resolutions for the new year, he says that he would neither take food in the expensive utensils nor he would drink from the glass tumbler. He says that he would pluck plantain leaves from his backyard and he would throw his spoons and he would use his own hands to eat everything. He says that he would take off his shoes and sandals and he would remain barefooted. Further, the poet says that he would go back this year while everyone thinks about the future. He would try to understand the feelings when going back. According to him, the main reason for him to move backward this year is the increasing number of lies, which he says that lies are very essential for every work. And it's very important to keep the flag of civilization up. And to march ahead, one has to tell lie. That's the reason that he would like to go backward instead of thinking for the future. Concluding the poem, the poet says that he swears not to tell a single lie as he shall not go forward, but he would go back to the humble beginnings of civilization because 
there's more fun in going back to that golden era of truthfulness. Let's analyze the poem. The poet wants to go away from the complex world of lies to the simple life where truth prevails freely. Hence, he makes different resolutions saying that instead of living in a house or the flat, he would like to be with nature as human beings used to be in the past in the old civilizations. He also comments on the habit of people buying new things and throwing the old things or not retaining the old things, which are the symbol of the past. That means we tend to forget the past so easily. The poet would like to lead a life of simplicity, which was a hallmark of the past civilizations. He would like to enjoy the past in the new year because this year the lies may increase. Hence, the poet is optimistic and he plans for a new future by going back to that era of truthfulness instead of going forward, which is filled with a lot of lies, lies and lies. Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. Many time we create a comfort zone and we prefer to stay in such comfort zone. We never courage to come out of the comfort zone and never enjoy the fruits of freedom and success. The person who is not courageous enough to take risk will accomplish nothing in life. We are going to talk about a person who breaks the barriers of his own imagination and he tastes the freedom Let's discuss a famous short story, The Wolf, written by Farooq Sarwar. Farooq Sarwar is one of the famous Pakistani writers who writes in English, Urdu and Pasto languages. He belongs to Quetta. He is a very noted novelist and short story writer. He has authored 12 books. He has won literary awards from the Academy of Letters, Pakistan, Government of Balochistan and Pakistan Television. The story The Wolf was written in Urdu language and later it was translated into English by M. Asaduddin. The story begins like this. The narrator has taken shelter in a tree due to the fear of the wolf. He is afraid of the wolf who is standing under the tree. He is afraid that if he comes down to the ground, the wolf will tear him into the pieces. The wolf might kill him. The narrator describes the tree on which he has taken shelter. The tree is unusual, but it's not a magical tree. Even though the tree grants him all the things he wishes for, example, a soft warm bed, television with stereo speakers, worldwide channels, and all kinds of food. He is very happy to be on the tree, which gives him all the comforts of life. But the only thing which he feels that he doesn't have, that is freedom. The narrator showed that the freedom comes with its cost and the cost is his life. If he tries to break away from the tree, he will be definitely killed by the wolf who is waiting for him below the tree. He thinks that he doesn't have the courage to face the wolf and destroy it. The narrator recalls the days in his life when the wolf was chasing him. He breaks into cold sweat and his heart sinks. He thanks God for saving him from the wolf by providing the tree so that he could be safe on it. Even in his despair, the narrator feels that he is safe because the tree is the tall one and the wolf cannot reach him. The narrator feels safe during the daytime but at night he is troubled by nightmares. He is worried because he is a captive in the tree. He wonders how long he has to suffer the agony of captivity. He wonders if he has to wait for the wolf to die of hunger to be free from the tree. But there is no hope at all. The wolf, instead of dying from hunger, is thriving and getting stronger day by day. One morning, the author is surprised to see that one more person who has also taken shelter on the same tree, the man had chosen the very same tree to escape from the another wolf which was troubling him. The wolf which was troubling the new man could not reach him. Both the narrator and the new man were afraid that the wolves were haunting them. Both of them have every means of comfort on the tree, but they were haunted by the boredom and the feeling of oppression. The frightful images of the wolves never allow them to sleep. They can't sleep peacefully. The narrator describes the nature and the attitude of the wolves. 
The wolves usually are silent, but sometimes they are overcome by madness and attack the tree ferociously, which frightens both of them. The narrator finds something unusual about the wolves. The other man's wolf does not bother the narrator, and the narrator's wolf does not bother the other man. What surprises the narrator is that even the wolves don't bother each other, then why should he be afraid of the wolves? One day, after long discussion, they both decide to get down and confront the wolves. They are fed up with the imprisonment on the tree. The narrator's friend jumps down. Even before his wolf could react, he kills it with a branch from the tree. Unfortunately, the narrator does not have the courage to get down and his wolf claws desperately at the tree trunk. The new man encourages the narrator to get down, assuring him that the wolf is weak and could easily be killed. The narrator does believe his words and shivers in fear. His wolf starts to shake the tree and strangely, the tree begins to shrink. The narrator is terrified and numbly wait for the death to take him, but the narrator's friend urges him to jump down. He convinces the narrator that the wolf is just an embodiment of imaginary fears which can be kicked out of our path to freedom. The narrator then gathers up all his courage and he jumps down. The narrator now feels free. He experiences the beautiful world of freedom. When he looks for his friend, he cannot find him. He looks around and finds himself surrounded by so many trees. He finds that each tree is occupied by one individual and a wolf is growling beneath each tree. The narrator then starts to laugh out loudly. He laughs at those people, those foolish people who are afraid of their wolves without any reason. Here, the wolf is a metaphor for our imaginary fears. Unless we overcome our imaginary fears, we will never be free. Without freedom, our life is oppressive. We have to face our wolves with courage and destroy them. Being comfortable is not being happy. The narrator and the man on the tree, though comfortably placed, but they are not happy. We all have to fight our demons and the wolves individually. The story can be read as an allegory of every man staying in his comfort zone, leading a life of boredom, frightened, haunted, and constantly oppressed, never testing the fruits of freedom. So we should try to come out of our comfort zone and live the life happily and enjoy the success. Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. It's very difficult to go away from the loved ones or send the loved one away from us. In this video, I will discuss a story titled Living, written by M.G. Vasanji. It's a story of a mother who does not want her son to go away from her sight. She has a kind of fear which every parents have whenever they send the children out of station for any purpose. About the author, M.G. Vasanji is a Toronto-based novelist of Indian origin. He was born in Nairobi, Kenya. He left Africa to study at the MIT and the University of Pennsylvania in the U.S., where he received his doctorate in nuclear physics. In 1978, he moved to Toronto and he was a research associate at the University of Toronto, during this period, he developed a keen interest in medieval Indian literature and history. As a gifted writer, his works represent the convergence of cultures and characterized both East Africa and North America. His writings focus on the issue of diaspora, migration, citizenship, gender, and ethnicity. Let's know about the characters in the story, Mother. The main character, she's the main character in the story, a mother of five children, Alu. Alu is the youngest child of the mother and he's interested to become a doctor. Next character is the narrator. The narrator is the second youngest child in the family and studies in a local university. Mr. Dattu. Mr. Dattu is a former teacher of Alu school. Mr. Welji. He's the former administrator of Alu school. Mahroon. Mahroon is the eldest child of the mother. She's married to a former opening batsman and she lives in a town. Razia. She's the second oldest child of the mother. She's a very wealthy housewife. She lives in Tango. 
Feroz. Feroz is the middle child of the mother and assistant bookkeeper at Oriental Emporium Library, as well as he's a school dropout. In the residential area of Yopanga, there lived a mother who had five children. She was a single parent as her husband passed away when she was only 33. She had refused to remarry because she was, she was afraid as her husband would send her children to an orphanage. Her two eldest daughters, Mehrun and Razia, were married. Her middle child, Firoz, was living separately. The mother was living with her two youngest children, Alu and the narrator. She moved to Yopanga after she sold her shop in the wild and the loud street of Uhuru so that her youngest children could study in peace. Indeed, she had very high hopes for her children. Alu, the youngest child, was a bright student. He usually got an A grade in every subject. He was in the last year of his school. Before his school finished, he had gone on a trip around the city with Mr. Dattu, a former teacher at his school who returned from America. After returning from the trip, Alu got inspired to do his further studies in America. He used to stare at the magazines with the photos of the universities of America. After his exams, he wrote many letters to many universities of America. He also got many inspiring responses from them. Finally, Alu got a letter from the California Institute of Technology, which offered him a scholarship. It was very hard for him to believe his eyes, so he wanted the narrator to reread it for him. He also had got a scholarship from his local university. He was surprised because he had previously applied for medicine, but he got scholarship for an agriculture instead, getting a scholarship from a medical college or from a medical university because he had a dream to become a doctor, not an expert in the agricultural field. One night when all three of them, Alu, the narrator and the mother were together, Alu started a conversation. He broke the news that he got a scholarship from an American university. The mother could not believe what he said for some time and she thought that he was teasing her. But indeed, it was the truth. Alu asked her if he could go, but she refused. She did not permit him to go abroad for further study because she thinks that Alu will leave the family. Alu then spoke back and raised his voice in front of her. For the first time, Alu felt sad because his mother did not fulfill his wish. Although Alu had an intense desire to study abroad, he obeyed his mother and now he is prepared to study agriculture in local college. After a few days, the mother thought of meeting Mr. Valji about her son's study plan. She took her two children, Alu and the narrator, to Mr. Welji, a former administrator of Alu school, for advice. After reaching Mr. Welji's office, the mother tells him all her family's past and background. She wanted Welji's suggestion for Alu's study. Mr. Welji listened to her and also observed Alu's documents. He came to the conclusion that the mother should let Alu go, but she would lose her son. The very night it was Alu's turn to be with his mother, she hugged Alu tightly and made Alu promise that Alu would not marry a white woman and would not drink or smoke. She finally let Alu go America for his study. It had been a week since Alu left home. His first letter arrived where he had mentioned that he had stopped to visit an old school met this reveals that this reveals his fascination for the foreign land. So in this story, we find here the following themes, the themes like separation, ambitiousness, importance of education, selflessness, and the fear of the unknown. Let's summarize. The story depicts the fear of separation of a mother from her children. The mother raises five children by herself after the death of her husband when she was 33 only. In the story, the youngest son, Alu, wants to study medicine in America. But the mother would not allow him to accept the offer 
due to the financial issues and the fear of losing her son. Finally, on the advice of a school teacher, the mother agrees, but she is not certain of her son's return. Hello, dear friends. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, we are going to discuss the chapter one of Wings of Fire by Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam. Awul Pakir General Abdin Abdul Kalam was an Indian aerospace scientist and statesman who served as the 11th President of India from 2002 to 2007. He was born and brought up in Rameshram, Tamil Nadu and studied physics and aerospace engineering. He was awarded Bharat Ratna, V. Savarkar Award, Hoover Medal. His full name was Awul Pakir General Abdin Abdul Kalam. He did his education, education from Madras Institute of Technology, Anna University. His parents were General Abdin and Ashiyama General Abdin. He was also known as the Missile Man of India. The chapter one of Wings Fire begins with a brief description of Kalam's family. Abdul Kalam was born into middle class Tamil family in the island town of Rameshwaram in the erstwhile Madras state. His father, General Abdin, had neither much formal education nor much wealth. Despite this, he possessed great wisdom and true generosity of spirit. His mother, Ashiyama, she used to feed poor people every day. Both parents were an ideal couple. Kalam was one of many children, a short boy with a rather undistinguished look, born to tall and handsome parents. Their house was a fairly puka house made of limestone and brick on the mosque street in Rameshwaram. He was provided all necessities like food, medicines and clothes. He had secure, he had a secure childhood both materially and emotionally. Kalam recalled the food made by his mother and served on a banana leaf. He says that his house was just 10 minutes walk from famous Shiva temple in Rameshwaram his father used to offer evening prayers in the mosque in his locality and used to pray for all the devotees and many people were cured by his father's prayers. The high priest of Rameshram temple, Pakshi Lakshmana Shastri, was a very close friend of Kalam's father. Both of them used to discuss spiritual matters in their traditional attire. When Kalam asked his father about the relevance of prayer, his father replied that prayer made a possible communion of the spirit between people. The prayer does not know any division of wealth, age, caste and creed. Kalam's father used to convey complex spiritual concepts in Tamil in a very easy manner. He conveyed that all human beings should understand the relevance of suffering and adversity always brings opportunities for introspection. His father also mentioned that one must understand the difference between a fear-ridden vision of destiny and the vision that enables us to seek the enemy of fulfillment within ourselves. Hence, Kalam's father had taught Kalam fundamental truths and convinced him that there exists a divine power that can lift one up from confusion, misery, melancholy and failure and guide one to one's true place. Once an individual cuts his emotional and physical bondage, he is on the road to freedom, happiness and peace of mind. Kalam believed that happiness and peace of mind come to us from within and not from external sources. When he was six years old, he was thrilled to watch his father who built a sailboat to take people from Rameshram to Dansukoda a place of pilgrimage. The boat was built on the wood, was seasoned over open fire for the various parts that were required. His father did quick business with the sailboat. Unfortunately, sometime later, it was destroyed in a severe cyclone that struck Rameshwaram. However, his father was much more worried about the falling down of the Pamban Bridge when a train filled with the passengers was upon it. Dr. Kalam says that he learnt a great deal from his father's feelings for others and even from the train disaster. 
he was exposed to the force and energy of the sea which men could not control jalaluddin and kalam were friends in spite of the age difference jalaluddin married kalam's sister zohra he was the only person in that island who could write english his first influence was more on kalam as jalaluddin was the person who exposed kalam to the latest discoveries literature and science kalam acquired different books from the personal library of str manikam another person who greatly influenced kalam's boyhood was his first cousin samsuddin samsuddin was the sole distributor for newspapers in in rameshwaram kalam had to satisfy just glancing at the pictures in the newspaper before samsuddin delivered them to his customers when kalam was 8 years old the second world war broke out in 1939 there was great demand of tamarind seeds in the market during the war and kalam used to collect them and sell them to a provision shop on the mosque street he used to earn one anna a day by selling those tamarind seeds kalam also used to help samsuddin to catch the newspapers bundles and fill the slot in this way kalam earned his own money for the very first time hence kalam inherited honesty and self discipline from his parents also goodness and deep kindness the unschooled wisdom of jalaluddin and samsuddin was so intuitive and responsive to non verbal message that dr abdul kalam unhesitantly attributes his manifested creativity to their company in his childhood the science teacher siva subramania ayer wanted to break the social barriers between the hindus and the muslims he wanted kalam to be very highly educated as he recognized his intelligence one day the science teacher invited kalam over a meal his orthodox wife was totally horrified at the idea of a muslim boy having food in her ritually pure kitchen he did not mind anything said by his uh, by his very conservative wife he rather served the food to kalam by his own hands and he also sat with him and dined together as well as invited him over again for the another meal the coming weekend thus this shows that he was a friend of abdul kalam even though kalam was a muslim and he himself was an orthodox brahmin kalam wanted to leave rameshram to study at the district headquarters in ramnathpuram kalam's father said that he knew that one day kalam had to go away to grow he says that the seagull flies across the sun alone and without a nest he then quoted khalil gibran to kalam's mother saying that her children were not her own children they were the sons and the daughters of life's longing for itself they came through their parents but not from them they may give them their love but not their thoughts as the children have their own thoughts abdul kalam's father's words bear great meanings first he inspires his son to go ahead by giving the example of the sea girl the sea girl flies across the sun alone and has to find its means of livelihood similarly every child has to get separated from the parents and find the means secondly he explains to kalam's mother quoting khalil gibran parents can give their love to children but not their thoughts children have their own thoughts he spoke those words to encourage abdul kalam and to control the emotional attachment of his wife for kalam while dropping kalam at the rameshram station he said this island may be housing of a body but not your soul your soul dwells in the house of tomorrow which none of us at rameshram can visit not even in your dreams not even in our dreams may god bless you my child samsuddin and jalaluddin traveled with him to ramnathpuram to admit kalam at shwards high school despite his homesickness kalam was determined to settle down in the new environment to fulfill the giant hopes of his father about his success the power of positive thinking made him to join shorts high school kalam said destiny did not lead me back to rameshwaram but rather 
swept me farther away from the home of my childhood so what do we receive from this chapter this extract gives us an introductory insight into kalam's life his childhood and the people who influenced abdul kalam his family his upbringing and his early days of struggle it also portrays their cultural and the religious context rameshram offered the young kalam there are a lot of age old traditions which have existed over the centuries do you think that these traditions should have any significance in modern india to understand this let's go through an important essay titled relations between men and women by raja ram mohan roy raja ram mohan roy was an indian socio educational reformer who was also known as maker of modern india father of modern india and father of bengal renaissance he lived during one of india's darkest social phases but he strived his best to make his motherland a better place for the future generations to come he was born into a prosperous brahmin family of bengal he challenged the traditional hindu culture and unorthodox religious ideas at a very young age he was a multilingual and a visionary person he wanted to combine the righteousness of western and indian culture he was against traditional hindu practices and echoed his voice against sati system caste system and child marriage he also wanted to modernize the education system and set up a lot of english medium schools he founded brahmo samaj atmi sabha and presidency university This essay is an extract from Raja Ram Mohan Roy's writing taken from Ramchandra Guha's Makers of Modern India it highlights the abominable practices like sati the caste system and gender discrimination Raja Ram Mohan Roy questions from which point of view women are considered inferior firstly they are never given a fair opportunity of exhibiting their natural capacity they cannot be accused of want of understanding women are always void of education and acquirements you cannot therefore in justice pronounce the inferiority hence women cannot be considered inferior to men secondly women are charged with a want of resolution we have seen in the past the male gets afraid with the name of the death whereas female has such firmness of mind that she offers to burn with the dead body of her deceased husband still women are accused of deficiency in point of resolution thirdly the author tests the trustworthiness of both male and female he says that the number of deceived women would be more compared to the betrayed men men are able to manage public affairs so they easily announce such faults as women occasionally commit but it cannot be considered as criminal the misconduct of men towards women in spite of this some of the women are misled to suffer themselves to be burnt to death fourthly are women subject to passion more than men to dispel this misconception raja ram mohan roy remarks that one man may marry two or three sometimes 10 wives while a woman marries only once and desires to follow him till his death leaving all worldly enjoyments or to follow the life of an ascetic fifthly the accusation of the want of virtuous knowledge is an injustice at marriage the wife is recognized as half of her husband but in after conduct they are treated worse than inferior animals the woman is employed to do the work of a slave in the house to clean the place very early in the morning whether cold or wet to wash the floor to cook night and day to prepare and serve food for her husband father mother-in-law sister-in-law brothers-in-law and friends and connections after all the male part of the family have satisfied themselves the women content themselves with what may be left whether sufficient in quantity or not where brahmans or kayasthas are not wealthy the women are obliged to attend to the cows 
and to prepare the cow dung for firing. In the afternoon, they fetch water from the river or tank, or at night, perform the office of menial servants in making the beds. In case of any fault or, or any kind of omission in the performance of those labors, they receive injurious treatment. Should the husband acquire wealth, he indulges in the criminal activities under her eyes and does not see her perhaps once a month. As long as the husband is poor, she suffers every kind of trouble and when he becomes rich, she is altogether heartbroken. So all this pain and affliction, their virtue enables them to tolerate or to support. Where a husband takes two or three wives to live with him, they are subjected to mental miseries and sometimes constant quarrels. Even this distressed situation, they, virtual, they virtuously tolerate it. Sometimes it happens that the husband, from a reference for one of his wives, he behaves very cruelly to other wife. So, with respect to virtue and the reputation generally, makes them forgive even this kind of treatment also. If unable to bear such cruel usage, sometimes wife may leave her husband's house and start living separately. In such case, the husband might take the support of legal, he will take the legal support and again bring her back. He will start again torturing her in all the ways and sometimes even puts her privately to death. So these are the facts occurring every day and they cannot be declined. And finally, Raja Ramon Rai, he says here, Raja Ramon Roy says here, what I lament is that seeing the women thus dependent and exposed to every misery, you feel for them no compassion that might exempt them from being tied down and burnt to death. So throughout the essay, we find here there are five assumptions which have been demolished by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. These assumptions are women are in general inferior to men, deficiency in point of resolution, women being unworthy of trust, are women subject to passion more than men, at marriage, wife is recognized, half of her husband. So hence, these five assumptions about women are discarded by Raja Ram Mohan Roy in this article, in this essay, Raja Ramon Roy has portrayed women as the embodiments of all the virtues. Dear friends, thank you so much for watching this video. You can reach me at mukeshenglish at the rate of gmail.com. Please do subscribe the channel. Click on the like button for more videos on literature, workbook, pronunciation, grammar, communication skills, presentation skills, interview skills. Stay in tune with Mukesh English. Thank you once again.